uh, per acre, averaged out over all the acres, continued to increase. A similar story lies behind modern wheat, which was d domesticated roughly 9,000 years ago in the Middle East. But the huge increase in global wheat yield happened in the 20th century through the efforts of agronomists like Norman Borlaug, who developed the modern high-yielding dwarf varieties that produced what we call the Green Revolution. Now, working together with Swami Nathan, this is a very old picture, uh, who's shown here with Borlaug and Swami Nathan, and with remarkable government support, they were able to increase wheat yields in Mexico, India, and Pakistan by as much as fivefold between 1950 and 2004. Amazingly, all of this was possible because of a few key mutations. We're back to genetics. But what I'd like to underline here is Swaminathan's political savvy. It was by bringing key politicians, including Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, to his experimental plots that he was able to persuade the government to invest scarce foreign exchange in bringing Borlaug's dwarf, dwarf wheat varieties into the country. That's a fascinating story in itself. So during the second half of the 20th century, scientists figured out what genes are and how they work, and they figured out how to move individual genes from one organism to another, creating what we now call a transgenic organism, a rather forbidding term. And it's these that came to be called genetically modified organisms, or GMO. Now, I'll briefly go over how that's done to underscore why it is simply another way of making use of what happens in nature. This diagram illustrates the tools that were used to create the first generation of GMOs. It's called recombinant DNA technology because a piece of a virus or a bacterial plasmid was recombined, put together, that's shown in stippled gray, with a purple piece, which is a, a piece of DNA from any other organism, a plant or an animal. The pieces are sealed together by an enzyme appropriately called a DNA ligase, slipped into a bacteria, and the bacterium, through its own natural processes, amplifies that to many thousands of copies. That made it possible completely analyzed the slip snippet of DNA represented in purple by techniques like DNA sequencing and to change it, to alter it to a slightly different sequence. That clone gene can now be expressed in a completely different organism because all organisms share the same mechanism for translating information stored in the DNA into RNA or protein. Now, for plants, this means enlisting the help of nature's genetic engineer, Agrobacterium. If you've ever visited Washington at cherry blossom time or seen pictures of it, uh, no, you can't see this from pictures. You have to really be there and look at the plants. The Japanese gifted the U.S. with these wonderful cherry trees a long time ago. They're very old, and they're covered with lumps like these which are caused by agrobacterium. That's a soil bacterium that has developed a trick of transferring its, a piece of DNA into a wounded plant cell. You see these where the, where the <coughs> gardeners have, have um, often cut off dead parts of the, of the, uh, of the tree and, and wounded it in the process. And it has the genetic trick of turning that cell into, I'm oh, sorry, pushing the wrong button, into a tumor. Here's diagrammatically what happens. Here's the bacterium, agrobacterium. It carries a small chromosome called a TI plasmid, and the bacterium and the, and the plasmid have genes on them that enable the, to, the bacterium to actually transfer a piece of that DNA into the plant cell. Now, once people figured out, scientists figured out how that was done, they could remove the tumor-causing genes and add a gene of their choice and let the bacterium and its processes carry the piece of DNA into the cell where it's integrated into the DNA of the, um, 
of the plant. If it's a crop, it's called a genetically modified or GM crop, or now we call them GMOs. Now, you might think that that never happens usefully in nature, but think about this. Researchers recently discovered that all the familiar sweet potatoes contain the tumor causing genes from agrobacteria, probably acquired thousands of years ago, because all of the different kinds of sweet potatoes carry them. Now, it isn't too difficult to imagine that the potatoes we harvest today originated as root tumors, but we don't know that for sure yet. Now, amongst the best-known GMOs are Bt maize and Bt cotton. The Bt version is at the top here and the bottom here. These are insects, belong to the same family, that attack the bowl or the stalk and the ear. Bt versions are protected from certain insects passed by a gene from a, another soil bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis. The gene codes for a protein that is toxic to the insect pests, but totally harmless to people and animals. Now, the point I'd like to make very forcefully is that this has been an important... Ladies and gentlemen, could you all just silence your ringers? My point here is that this has been a huge step towards sustainability of agriculture. Globally, we use about a billion pounds of chemical insecticides a year. These kill both pests and beneficial insects, and they kill people. In developed countries, pesticides are sprayed from big uh, tractors with air-conditioned cabs or drones today. Uh, in less developed countries, certainly in India, they're often sprayed by barefoot farmers with a pack on their back, and there are still millions of um, pesticide poisonings a year. Specifically, insecticide. Pesticide is a broader term. Now, according to recent estimates, insecticide used to control these insects has decreased by almost 90% globally for corn <coughs> and almost 60% for cotton. Now, to date, cotton, as you, Bt cotton, as you probably know, is the only genetically modified crop in wide use here in India. And I'll get back to that eventually. But let's look at the global picture first. Since they were introduced in 1996, GM crops have been adopted by farmers faster than any in the history of humanity. Today, GM crops are grown uh, uh, by roughly 18 million farmers in 26 countries on 470 million acres. Those are rough estimates. Now, the important point here is that 90% of, of the farmers growing them are smallholder, resource-poor farmers. And the profits have gone roughly equally to developed country farmers and developing country farmers. Now, here's a, a, a very simplified analysis of a survey from 1996 through 2014, when the study was done, of the e economic and, and environmental impacts. First of all, pesticide use decreased by more than a third, a third, and pesticide costs have gone down almost 40, had gone down in 20, by 2014 by almost 40%. GMCs cost more than conventional ones, but this cost has largely been offset by savings in labor and chemical costs. Yields have increased by more than 20%, and farmer incomes by almost 70%. That's a global figure, but the important point is that that size of increase is largely in the incomes of developing world farmers, not developed world farmers, where it's a small fraction of their total income. Now, here's one of the only developments, GM crops, to come out of the public sector. It was uh, carried out by a collaboration between Cornell University and the University of Hawaii. 
in the 19, early 1990s, uh, the papaya ring spot virus, I don't know whether you can see there are little rings on the surface of the uh, fruit, but here's what it does to the trees. It basically decimate, was decimating the papaya industry in Hawaii on the big island, and there was no cure. People had looked for decades for resistance genes, hadn't found them. Now, what the researchers did was introduce a little piece of of viral DNA into the plant, and within four or five years of the release of the first seeds, the industry had begun to bounce back to its pre-viral levels. This directly benefited small farmers. Most of the farmers that grow papaya trees are smallholder resource poor farmers. So I want to come back to the fact that the only organisms that are called GMOs today are ones that have been modified by the molecular methods that I just went over. These and only these have been subjected to expensive and prolonged regulatory scrutiny in the countries that even allow them. Many countries don't yet allow them to be grown as they do not have a regulatory framework in place. Others, because the process of deregulation has become so politicized that has come to a standstill. Now, one of the major techniques developed by plant breeders in the 20th century was chemical and radiation mutagenesis. That is, if you expose seeds or sometimes shoots to radiation or mutagenic chemicals, you induce a lot of mutations at the same time. People planted them out and looked for the very small fraction of them that were useful. Today's crop plants, about half of today's crop plants, have a radiation or chemical mutagenesis step in their pedigree. These techniques have never been regulated, and in fact, um, radiation and chemical mutagenesis is a little bit about taking a shotgun to the genes and just shooting holes, and then the, as the plant repairs them, it introduces mutations, and then you look for the good ones. Still not regulated. Now, the latest refinement in molecular technology is referred to as gene or genome editing. And the method makes it possible to change or edit the, the, the sequence of a selected target gene much more precisely than we've ever been able to do before. Now, again, by understanding how a natural system works, it's been possible to make use of it in new ways. Now, not long ago, scientists found that certain bacteria <clears throat> had a rather strange collection of what are called clustered regulated instant short palindromic repeats. That's a mouthful. Everybody knows CRISPR. Nobody knows what it stands for. Now, this eventually led to the discovery of a mechanism that the bacteria used to protect themselves from invading viruses. The CRISPR collection contains bits of viral DNA sequence, and these are read out into RNA molecules with a hairpin handle, here it is, that binds to an enzyme called Cas, that's represented by this green blob, and it also has a piece of the uh, transcript of the viral, the short viral DNA sequence. This complex finds its way to the viral DNA as it's invading, slips in, and allows the Cas enzyme to cut, make a double-stranded cut. The cut DNA is then repaired, often imperfectly crippling the invading virus. Now, having figured out how it works, scientists could replace the guide RNA with the sequence of their choice to target this little molecular machine to the gene, to the gene that the scientists wants it to find. There it cuts the DNA again, which is repaired by the natural processes, usually introducing a mutation, commonly in inactivates the gene. Now, the important point is that the kind of breakage and repair that underlies this process is exactly the same kind of breakage that happens to generate spontaneous mutations and that happens when you bombard uh, the DNA with radiation or a chemical mutagen. 
it's at the molecular level, it's all the same thing. The difference is the, the previous method was random. As I said, it's kind of like taking a shotgun to the genome to make these breaks. Here, you can target just the gene you want to change. And what understanding and taming this genetic mechanism has, of course, allowed scientists to do is direct this process very precisely. Let me show you an example, which I think is kind of cute. Um, there are hornless beef cattle, but no hornless dairy cattle. Having learned what gene uh, was disrupted to make hornless cattle, scientists at a little company called Recalmanetics disrupted the same gene in dairy cattle. Dairy cattle are dehorned de for their safety and the safety of the caretakers by burning off the budding calves. Physical dehorning is painful. Genetic dehorning is painless. Now, these new methods pose a quandary for regulators and politicians formulating biosafety laws. Until now, a GMO was basically an organism to which some genetic material had been added, and this genetic material could be traced using molecular tests. However, using this new method, scientists can make the same kinds of mutations that are made by older techniques using chemicals and radiation. The new gene editing methods make it possible to just, to, to change just the desired target gene or genes. Now, the older methods were not regulated. Should organism with this new kind of highly targeted gene editing be regulated? Like those that contain new genes, even? These are questions that are being answered today in different countries in different ways, but the underlying essential question is this. Should they be regulated? Is there evidence that either the first generation of GMOs or this kind of change or the older kind of changes are GMOs at all dangerous? And if they're not, why are we continuing to be so upset about them and regu regulate them so stringently? Well, back in the early days of GM technology, people worried about whether GM foods were safe to eat. This was a new technology. Everybody always worries about new gen the technologies. Back in the 1980s, when the first agricultural applications were being developed in the US, please turn off your phones. The U.S. National Academy of Science has issued a white paper analyzing the issues raised by the use of recombinant DNA technology outside of laboratories. Until that point, all of the experimentation with um, recombinant DNA technology was carried out inside of laboratories and containment facilities of one level or another. Now, the conclusion of this white paper was that there really weren't. The, the issues facing agriculture, for example, were basically the same ones that were raised by older genetic modification technologies. And so what this paper concluded was that the regulation of genetically modified organisms should be based on the nature of the organism and the environment into which it is introduced and not on the method by which it was produced. Now, in roughly the same time frame, the uh, President's Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is headed by the President's Science Advisor, and its function is to bring together the federal agencies uh, that across the government. And there were three agencies that wanted to regulate this once it got out of laboratories. That was the Food and Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the US Department of Agriculture. So OSTP, which is the initials by which the Office of Science and Technology goes, brought these agencies together, said, write us a framework, put it together a framework based on what you know, what is known about the science, uh, for regulating these new uh, methods of modification. Now, the OSTP, that framework was written and published in 1986. 
The OSTP then directed the relevant regulatory agencies to find existing statutes because it was general consensus that the issues that were confronting GM organisms were the same as the what confronted organisms altered by older technologies. So OSTP said, go find statutes you already have and regulate those and regulate the product, not the process. But that's not what happened. For the past 30 years, only organisms modified by molecular methods have been regulated. Moreover, the regulatory process has been complex, expensive, opaque, and lasting for years. There's a genetically modified salmon, which has an, an extra copy of a growth hormone gene in it so that it grows year round rather than seasonally. It has, holds the record for getting stuck in the regulatory process. It's been held up for more than 20 years. So, what people worried about in the early days were things that were not anticipated. Will there be unanticipated hazards? Will they be found? So the next question is, have they been found? We now have, depending on how you count it, three to four decades of experience with transgenic organisms. The European Union has invested more than 300 million euros in biosafety research. This report, which summarizes the first 25 years of biosafety research, was published in 20, 2010. Its conclusion, crop modification by GM techniques is no more dangerous than crop modification by older methods, which I remind you include chemical and uh, mutagens and radiation mutagenesis. Now, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences has published several reports on GMOs. The latest one looks back over those three decades and reviews the studies that have been done. You can download it off the internet, but I warn you it runs to 400 pages, so I'm going to summarize that in one slide. The committee reviewed almost 1,800 studies. Now, there are many one-off studies, but they focused. They had to figure out which ones were scientific and credible and which are not. And of course, in science, it depends on reproducibility. One report means essentially nothing. Two reports means more than one. Ten to one, a hundred to one, or a thousand to one gives you much more confidence that you have made the correct conclusion. Oh, their conclusion, there's no credible evidence, remember credible evidence, that today's GM crops are harmful to either humans or animals. Repeat, no credible evidence that either people or animals are harmed by eating GM food or feed. But the public is not convinced anywhere in the world. I'm going to show you the results of a poll conducted, that's a survey conducted by a very credible research um, group called the Pew Research Center. They did a poll of American public at, at large and then an unselected group of scientists belonging to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. That's AAAS, that's the publisher of Science Magazine, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Now, not very surprisingly, they found that almost 90% of the scientists polled thought GM food was safe to eat. But less than half of the public agreed. That's a bigger difference of 51 points between the scientists and the public. That's a bigger spread that exists even on climate change. Uh, on the 90% of scientists are quite convinced that climate change has a big component of human activity contributing to it. And about half of the public believes that. Well, 
why is there such a difference between what people think and what scientists think? Well, I'm going to give you a short answer and then I'm going to expand it. It turns out to be a great deal easier to scare people than it is to reassure them once they've been frightened. I'll get back to that issue. But first, given the largely negative public opinion, do we really need GMOs? And here I'm giving you my argument for why we need these biological tools if we're to maintain even today's level of food production, which people generally agree is sufficient to feed virtually everyone in the world a good diet, and yet we have huge inequalities of distribution with people continuing to be undernourished and then others totally overnourished. Okay. Here's my argument. First of all, our numbers are still growing. Population growth is slowing, but it's not likely to stop much short of 10 billion. We're about seven and a half million, maybe a little bit more today. But there's an important point here, and that is that technology and you're in the middle of it, is bringing more and more people out of poverty. As people get out of poverty, they want a better diet. And that means more meat. And meat takes more grain, more land, more water than simply eating uh, meat. Producing meat takes more grain, more water, more land than simply eating the grain. And that's illustrated here. And this is what has been happening. Here's population growth. Here's the amount of land available per person. Not hard to see what the trend there is. Same is true for land. Between 1975 and 2005, the amount of arable land available per person declined by anywhere between 16 and 45 percent. What that's basically saying is that we're adding people faster than we're adding arable land. Not surprising, most of the best arable land on the face of the earth is already being farmed. While the globally agricultural productivity stayed ahead of population growth during the last century, that isn't true today. Global agricultural productivity is a complex measurement. This is from the Global Harvest Initiative, and this is their 2018 projections. What they project is that if we're just to keep up with population growth, this is the curve we should be on. This is the curve that less developed countries are on. This is the curve. Here are the data points. This is an extrapolation. So simply put, we're facing a growing gap between how much we're increasing agricultural productivity and how much we need to increase it just to keep up with population growth. Now, this is a complicated problem, and GM uh, plants and animals are only part of the solution. There's a lot of other technology Reducing waste, uh, it's a different problem in different countries. There's a great deal that can be done with technology. But here I'm going to say, I'm going to commit myself say, and say that my strong conviction is that GMOs are an essential part of, sol of the solution, and that's because of climate warming. So the IPCC's new report that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's a UN body of scientists from all over the world that come together to tell us what's going to happen if we keep up our current behaviors. So they're telling us that we have about a decade left to reorganize our energy economy if we're to avoid ever more severe disruptions to our lives and our food supply. But even if we succeed, we are faced, and, and nobody thinks we will succeed at the level we need to, um, even if we did. We're facing continuing agricultural disruptions from the warming that's already happened. Technology can get us just so far in the shifting climate. The rest has to come from biology. Here's why. Higher temperatures mean lower yields. Maize, which we call corn in the US, fails at about 35 degrees. Soybeans fail 
at about 39 degrees. These are two of the most important sources of calories for humanity, both directly and through feed for animals and fish. Here are projections from 1986 to the close of the 21st century. The darkest color shows the area expected to experience 200 or more days per year at or above the critical temperature. That's pretty sobering. Our crops were domesticated in a different climate regime. We're moving out of that into a new climate regime. How are we going to adapt them to continue to yield at the higher temperatures? Whether you stick to plant breeding or genetic modification, this is what biology has to do. And climate change is already upon us. Its face is more storms. But this, this is the storm that just devastated a large swath of uh, Florida in my country. But already we're seeing more storms, more flooding, more drought, and fiercer fires. We are currently just recovering from the worst fire that we have ever experienced in the history of our nation. There are hundreds of people missing. There are thousands of homes that have been destroyed. Now, what are the impediments to making wider use of modern molecular methods in agriculture? I remind you that even in the US, which is a major adopter of GM crops, and where most scientists think GM foods are safe to eat, less than half of the public does. People today have no idea what a GMO is, but they certainly know they're bad. Watch this. I do. OK, I yeah. think I need some sound. Uh, just, there's just a vibration with GMOs. Uh, for me personally, it's just something that I don't uh, particularly want to put into my body. What does GMO stand for? Genetically modified. Genetically modified. The O? The O. <laughs> G G I don't know. Do you try to avoid GMOs in your diet? Yeah, absolutely. Why is that? Um, just the effects, I guess, on, on myself. And what does GMO stand for? Oh, man, putting me on um, the, under the grill. Let's see. I don't even remember. <laughs> uh, Do you try to avoid GMOs in your diet? Absolutely. Why? Because they're not good for you. What is a GMO? It's, it's a genetically mono, mono, I don't know, what is it? If you are eating whole foods, you want to eat what you're, you're eating. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You want to eat what you see. And so, and, and you're avoiding processed food, but when the whole food is somehow contaminated, that's, avoid, that's kind of making it a moat. Point. What does GMO stand for? Genetically manufactured. Oh. <laughs> what is a GMO? A uh, general, general modified ingredient, right? What is a GMO? Uh, it's a gen, it's a something modified. Do you try to avoid GMOs? <laughs> Sometimes, not a whole lot, but you know, I, I try. What is a GMO? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I swear. I was just going along with it. I don't know what GMO is. What is a GMO? I don't know. I know it's like some corn bad stuff, right? <laughs> I know it's bad, but to be completely honest with you, I have no idea. I bet if you conducted these uh, interviews here, you would get your own version of, I have no idea, but I know it's bad. Why? 
So just Google GMOs, and you'll quickly see that GMOs have been blamed for everything from farmer suicides here in India, tumors in rats, and every manner of human ill, from autism to obesity to infertility and cancer. Parenthetically, some of those accusations were leveled against the Green Revolution strains when they were first introduced here in India. Now, none of this is true. What this particularly unscrupulous scientist did was to use rats that spontaneously develop tumors if you keep them alive long enough, and of course you're not supposed to. He did, and he claimed that the tumors were caused by the GM maize that he fed them, but they weren't. The paper was retracted, but these images live on. You can find them in the electronic world, and the fears live on in people. There are more reasons that GMOs remain controversial almost everywhere. There's a strong strain of antipathy to big companies like Monsanto, often called Monsatan, because they make money from selling biotech seeds. Now, unless, until the last century, most farmers grew their crops from seeds they saved from last year's crop, and that's true in parts of the world today. But since plant breeding became a profession, new plant varieties have been protected in the US by patents that started in the 1930s. And companies have taken over the business of pr producing high quality hybrids and disease free seeds. Today, most developed world farmers buy seeds because their yields are better and they avoid diseases that often linger in saved seeds. And that's increasingly true in the developing world as well. And there's more. The controversy continues to be churned by organizations that create and exploit GMO fears for profit. The organic food industry has conducted a very deliberate campaign of vilifying GMOs. Simple objective, increase their market share. Greenpeace's anti-GMO campaign is one of their bigger, biggest money makers. Why would they give it up? these vilification campaigns have been effective. Golden rice, to me, is a particularly poignant example. This is a ripe variety developed by Ingo Patricus and Peter Beyer and their teams 20 more plus years ago. They added genes that support biosynthesis of beta carotene. That's why it's called golden rice. And it's converted to vitamin A in the human body. What you see here is the destruction of experimental fields by demonstrators paid and brought in from neighboring cities. Well, golden rice continues to be controversial, and vitamin A deficiency continues to be responsible for more than 2 million preventable deaths annually, largely of women and children in poor countries. Now, the good news is that after decades of delay, Golden rice has been approved in several countries, who largely don't, which largely don't need them, Australia, Canada, and the US. But it is inching closer to approval in Bangladesh, where it is needed. And then there are individuals, individuals like Jeffrey Smith in the US, and your very own Vandana Shiva, who make a living writing books and speaking about the imaginary evils of GMOs. These individuals have become extraordinarily influential through their ability to construct alternative realities from the facts that they choose. They make up facts. This is something that, unfortunately, we in the US have become all too familiar under our current uh, president. But it doesn't make it right or true. And because they make a living scaring people about GMOs, and scientists, by the way, have other things to do. The alternative realities constructed by anti-GMO organizations and individuals have shaped the GMO conversation in thereby the views of people around the world. And as I mentioned earlier, our psyches are such that it's much easier to scare people than it is to reassure them. Okay, countering misinformation with reliable information is essential, of course. Here are two very reliable websites, neither of which is supported by the biotech industry, which concerns some people. Academics 
review website does just what its subtitle says, if you can read it. That is, its writers are all scientists uh, with knowledge of this area, and they test popular claims against peer-reviewed science. The Genetic Literacy Project is a site that features readable and reliable short articles on every aspect of both plant and animal biotechnology from all over the world. But while debunking misinformation is important, recent um, studies have made it all too clear that simply debunking misinformation Just delivering facts is remarkably ineffective at changing people's beliefs. This is because beliefs are formed at a rather intuitive level, for the most part, based on underlying moral principles, emotions, religious beliefs. So to address beliefs, it's essential to connect with people at that level, irrespective of their educational level. Now, I'm going to show you just an example of how you can deliver information, factual information, with an emotional impact. I'm going to show you a clip that I produced from a recent film, which is available everywhere around the world. It's called Food Evolution. I've put together fragments from it just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. And it's, the, the example is taken from Uganda, where I was speaking just uh, a few weeks back are now faced with the worst bacterial disease so far, known as banana xanthomonas wilt. The disease has had a devastating impact on banana cultivation, forcing some farmers to abandon their crop. Amatoka ago, bana Uganda wano yemere ya we indoze chasinzi. Currently, nearly half of all banana plants in Uganda have been wiped out by banana wilt, threatening the food security of 14 million Ugandans more than a third of the population. Kati wogenda kuchite mamu, kuchisanga mu, ebi mtu, ebi munda, ebi ya black, ebi la bikanti. Nekatera wetuli chitu kosa kubanga nkugambi enti chola bie edi. Wano nalinzi jabuzi obansa nzeka nente manentu wala nefumba nekukola chinebuja. Na ulo kubela enti chiruade atene wano nkugambi enti kaba kakaluwa kalinga muti. She could not get food for herself or for her family so she's devastated. Osoboro chita watemane no chite kako omuliro. No chitwala no chiteka wantu no chikurachi no sima wo echinya no zika no mara no kurachi no vipo. Or once someone has hit you have to just cut down barn and wait for maybe six months to a year for it to get out of the garden. Nga mapapa ali tetisobola. I would call it the Ebola of the banana. It comes and wipes away the whole plantation. To fight the devastation of banana wilt, scientists in Uganda and Kenya are working on a genetically engineered fix similar to what was done in Hawaii with papaya. Except their work is done behind a locked gate and is currently prohibited from being released to the public. Hi, I'm Lina Tripachi. I'm leading the transgenic research in IHTA and my focus is on disease and pest resistance. So we find out that there are some resistant genes in sweet pepper. These are the genes we are using to transfer resistance from sweet pepper to banana. The banana bacterial disease. So feel free to touch and even the fruits you can, if you can touch them. This is the only time. I got to know that they actually GMOs are not bad like they used to say. Emma, do you think this crop integrate well the system you have been practicing? Mm, even better. So it does well. I wouldn't mind growing a GM crop in my garden. To me, I, I would think the transgenic is ready. Why, what, what makes it not ready? 
yeah, is the is there by safety law Zero. which mm. is not in place. Zero. So I don't know why they don't consider. <laughs> Maybe we have to like con uh, uh, change their perception for that. You know, the government has to be forced to put the law in place. Yeah. When I saw Francis's face, she also could not believe that there was an answer to her problem. And she was like, can you give us these plants yesterday? But it was so bad. She could not get the GMO plants that she had to wait for another two, three, four years for the research to be approved. So this is the film, Food Evolution. It's available on Netflix and uh, YouTube. It's produced by filmmaker Scott Kennedy and narrated by a famous American scientist, Neil deGrasse Tyson. The New York Times said about this film, with a soft tone, respectful to opponents, but insistent on the data, Food Evolution posits an inconvenient truth for organic boosters to swallow. In a world desperate for safe, sustainable food, GMOs may well be a force for good. So the film lays out both the controversy and the science in a way that makes it possible for the viewer to make judgments for himself or herself. Now, I would be remiss, I'm going to just take a few more minutes of your time to bring up the current controversy around India's one biotech cot, bullworm resistant cotton. Depending on the writer's perspective, it's presented either as a triumph or a tragedy. The reality, of course, is more complex. Yields rose after the introduction of BT cotton. You can see that here. Um, India is now a, a cotton exporting country and the first one, the largest one in the world. Now, recently, what people have pointed out is that uh, well, they, they have tried to persuade you that the BT trade had nothing to do with the increase in yield, that it was all about fertilizer and agronomic practices because this curve rose faster than this. Not taking into advantage that a lot of uh, uh, black market, shall we say, seed was, was planted. It was much more widely planted than the approved areas. And then the yields have leveled off. There are many uh, factors that contribute to that, and it's different in different geographic areas. Altered agronomic practices, increasing adoption of hybrid seeds, seed adulteration, and more recently, weather anomalies that may well be due to the increasing impact of climate change. All that said, the studies that have, the good studies that have been done have shown that there have been increases, significant increases in both yield and farmer income. Now, recent years have unfortunately seen a progressive increase in resistance of the pest, the pink bollworm, even to varieties that express two BT genes. Now, these are problems that can be solved with improved agronomic and pest management practices. That's the science. But in the court of public opinion, the BT cotton itself has become a scapegoat and it could sway people and their politicians to turn against GM technology as a whole. That would be a tragedy for the reasons that I've tried to share with you. With our numbers still growing and climate change beginning to have a serious impact, we simply can't stop working to increase agricultural productivity sustainably everywhere. Fortunately, there's ample technology to bring to bear from precision farming to the kinds of genetic modifications that can reduce pre-harvest loss to pathogens, pest, and importantly, weather extremes. <coughs> but whether we're able to use that technology to help us achieve food security and maintain it depends on people and their politicians. What we as scientists must do is to understand the more complex truth and to speak it patiently, frequently, through all available media for as long as it takes. Thank you. I'm delighted to answer questions.
Thank you, Professor Nina. Okay, that was an excellent uh, overview of the whole thing. Um, maybe we can have some questions for about five, ten minutes. Anybody in the audience? Uh, can you wait until? Maybe uh, are there a couple of microphones that people could? Yeah, because yeah. yeah, you've got one person. Are there a couple more microphones? Good. And somebody else to pass them around? No, no, I'm fine. I want to talk to people. Excuse me. There's a, can you, you we take can, the You can question? introduce yourself, tell your name, and then ask a question. Uh, I'm uh, Ganesh Prasad, studying in uh, first PhD in the Department of Genetics in this college. Uh, actually, I would like to thank you for the wonderful presentation. And my question is, uh, you said 88% uh, of the scientists uh, would believe that GM crops are beneficial for the citizens. And uh, why don't the rest 12% believe that it is dangerous? Uh, can uh, I have your view on that? For very obvious reasons. Um, if you're not a specialist in an area, you're in the same camp as the general public. So very often, um, scientists haven't thought about it. They just have a gut reaction and they've heard, you know, they've heard bad things or they've read something on the internet. It's the same reason that other people uh, believe. If you, if you just assayed uh, scientists who are familiar with the techniques and the results, I think you'd be much closer to 100%. Could we take one question per person and there yeah, was a yeah. person back here. I mean, these discussions are there, there's tea time, we can, we can talk about it. Now, the, the, the microphone should be for the yeah. questioners. Uh, thank yeah. you, Professor, uh, for the talk. Uh, uh, I have uh, an observation which I wanted to uh, ask your view on. Um, I think that um, scientists are missing at few places uh, to present their views on. So what I see the system is as... Uh, vertices of a quadrilateral where there's, there's a, a scientific body or an institution. There is, uh, of course, the government and the policy makers. <coughs> then there are the end users who are the farmers. And the fourth and I think a really important and often not talked about vertex of this quadrilateral is the uh, companies which own the patent rights as well as the, uh, the, the rights over the crops, the seeds, the, the pesticides which they uh, develop specifically to be used with their crops. And I think that's where uh, these people like Vandana Shiva and uh, Jeffrey, I, I don't remember his uh, right. name. So uh, these people have some arguments which uh, like... Uh, I'm familiar with the arguments. Get to yeah, the question. Yeah, so, yeah, the question is what do you think of uh, the involvement of scientists? Where, where are we lacking so that this quadrilateral sort of gets complete? Because Monsanto does not have any um, roots in India because of this. And I think that there are only few companies like Monsanto which come into okay. the picture. Can you reiterate your question? Okay. What should scientists be? Why? Uh, the question is how do you uh, make how? sure that uh, the implementation to the end user uh, uh, is done when, the, when there are big giants like Monsanto playing the game? The, Thank the you. answer to that is pretty simple you stop regulating so much. The reason we have big biotech companies and only commodity crops is because those are the only organization, the only crops that can support both the development and the regulatory costs. You have an enormous amount of, of fantastic biotechnology research. I mean, I've been mostly uh, exposed to what is being done in plants. But there's very important stuff being done and Frankly, academic scientists, I don't care whether it's in India or in the US, don't have the money to get through this regulatory mess, okay? And if it's not necessary, why are we continuing to do it? The reason is that once you get stuck in a legal requirement, it's very difficult to back off of it. In the early days of biotech regulation in the US, there was an advisory committee, not a law. And what that advisory committee did was to look at the emerging data. And when there was enough data to say, well, there's no problems that have emerged, don't regulate this anymore. Once the regulatory agencies with their laws 
got into the business, it all came to a halt, and it was constantly process-based, not trait-based. Now, in the U.S., there's a glimmer of hope, and that is that our department, our Secretary of Agriculture, has already announced that um, the Department of Agriculture will not be uh, regulating traits that are introduced through CRISPR-Cas technology that could have occurred by older, unregulated technologies. If it wasn't regulated then when you had a random technique, why should you be regulating it now? <clears throat> the department wants to go even farther than that. Whether it will succeed, I don't know. But to go to what was originally intended, trait-based regulation. And the traits that they will regulate are the traits that they should be concerned about, which is plant weeds and pathogens. That would be a huge step in the right direction. And I think that uh, a number of countries who have successfully adopted GMOs are coming together to um, have a conversation with the World Trade Organization so that one part of the world isn't regulating this new technology much more stringently than the other. Europe, to, what has happened in Europe is that the highest court in the European Union, the EJC, has decided that has made the decision based on their considerations that the new technologies should be regulated the way GMOs were. It's now up to scientists and parliamentarians to alter the laws in such a way that the, existing, the accumulated evidence is taken into consideration. If there's no harm for all those years of regulating, they should really recognize that and regulate the new techniques differently. Thank you. That's a to long add, answer. To add a point to what I Professor Nina is saying to your benefit, there is a, uh, one of the systems that we have in India is the, thing, the most stringent mechanism of evaluation of transgenic material. Uh, the GEAC, that is the Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee, and then the RCGM, which is the Review Committee for Genetic Manipulations. Both those committees are really top class ones, and they take a lot of uh, uh, effort in terms of regulating this. But the issue comes is when you now do the field trials. There are some of these two things which are called the BRL, you know, the uh, Biosafety Research Level 1 and 2 trials that are done. And they are very costly because of the requirement that you have to now fulfill the other 12% of the people who do not agree to this. And that is costly. Now the cost is who is going to bear. If the government is going to give the money, this is the issue. Then the question is, can we now work with, let's say, companies like somebody who can pay money to us to do this? If we agree to those kind of things, I'm sure there is a positiveness in this. One of the finest or the most precise way of breeding is through transgenics. So we know this, but then we are scared of the unknown. I do not know what it is. Anyway, we can discuss about that for a long time. Uh, Professor Nair, you have a question? No, no, I, I think you, you said it uh, just uh, for the information of my friend. Uh, just one floor above you, there are many transgenics which were produced uh, in crops that could be potentially useful for this country the last many years, and many of them are languishing because of permissions to do the field trials. I think that if those problems can be overcome, if the regulatory um, legislation is written in a way that reflects the reality, uh, you would see a proliferation of useful modifications that would go directly to farmers from the research community. This is true everywhere in the world. Yeah. Um. I'm Nataraj Karaba from the Department of Crop Physiology. So my question is, uh, we know that the technology is perfect. We know what we are editing in this uh, type of genetic modification. No, I, I would not call it perfect. Yeah. I think that's the word you use. <coughs> All right. No it's, technology We know is what we are editing. We would put that way. Yeah. So the, my question here is that 12% of biologists don't agree. And majority of the public do not agree. So, majority of biologists agree. So, what is the problem? Do you have some idea that we are failing in transferring yes. knowledge from lab I to land? Yes, I think we are all what failing. what we should do towards the direction? Yes, yes. Now, most scientists are not trained. They get up at a podium and they, they deliver facts, facts very rapidly, okay? The reason I showed you the clip is that it delivered facts in a way that has an immediate impact and I bet you'll remember it, okay? You have a wonderful film industry here. This is about, this film is useful, but it's about Hawaii and America and Africa. 
it's not about India. You have your own wonderful stories. Bangladesh, there are some, by the way, there are some clips on the internet about <clears throat> Bangladesh's success with BT Brinjal, which is politically stopped here. Uh, but what filmmakers bring to it is that they show the human side of things. And this, we're not very good at. That's one. And second, um, you have young people, all of whom are carrying computers that they operate with their fingers, and incredible video cameras, communicate. Uh, as you learn, I mean, there are, there are places that you can go right outside of, I mean, you have Metahelix, and you have probably other countries. I happen to know Metahelix better because I've visited before. But, but the point is that you can find visual facts and communicate them and involve um, students much more into going out into schools and letting younger students know what biotechnology can do. You have a question. I, I suggest that you please raise your hand above your shoulder. That's right. what I keep telling you. One question per person, please. Yeah, one question and raise your hand above the shoulder so that he knows. Okay, you have a question. Stand up, introduce yourself. Ma'am, I'm Akshita, studying junior MS in the Department of Genetics and Plant Breeding here. My question is, uh, when the biosafety of the genetical GMO crops comes into matter, people say the hazardous effects of genetic GMO crops will not be instant and it's going to be longer time. After many years, it's going to be hazardous. People have that perception. So how can we address those people? Um, by saying that, telling them how plants were modified in the last century. And by saying, basically, at this point, we have more than half a century. How many decades? 10 enough? No. 20 enough? 30? 40? OK. So. There has never been a food introduced, whether it was produced, a variety produced by chemical radiation mutagenesis or a spontaneous mutation, that has undergone as much scrutiny and so many studies as modern genetically modified plants. So I would suggest to you that you show them that given the amount of testing that's done on the proteins for toxicity, allergenicity, all of those things are in the process for approval. These are the safest foods that have ever been introduced into the human food supply. And we know that because we've been studying and studying and studying. And we have tools that even 50 years ago people didn't have. Metabolomics, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics. So you can do a profile of a transgenic plant, which companies routinely do. And you can know whether it's in the range of variation. People often do studies with uncharacterized plants, and they say, oh, well, this transgenic plant had more effect than this. But are these in the range of what happens? That we can determine today. Never could do that before. And in all the history of radiation and uh, chemical mutagenesis, there are one or two incidents of mild things. So there was a potato that was bred for insect resistance and the content of glycoalkaloids, which make people a little nauseous, increased. People caught that and pulled it out, but they didn't have to be tested then. And there's another example. Um, celery produces sorolin, which is a um, DNA cross-linking agent. Breeding. Um, Celery for, for, for insect resistance produced a higher concentration of sorolin, which gave people skin rashes, the people that worked in the fields. That's out of thousands of experiments that were random mutations. So if no disaster happened then, why would you expect, when you can surgically go in and modify just one gene, why would you expect that be, to be a worse problem? It's something like many, many times when we are allergic to some of the food that we eat, like, for example, brinjal, eggplant, some people are allergic. So you stop everything, that's the issue. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. But the other thing is that 
people are perfectly willing to take a completely different fruit from a different part of the company. So kiwi was very recently introduced into the US. It's got a major allergen in it, okay? But did anyone did test it before it was introduced? They, they no. that the test is done for the uh, allergens which are there in the, in the, in the, yes. in the book, you know, that is there. All the allergens we, must be tested first. We know, no, actually, we know more about allergens and their databases. Yes. And what has to happen is if there's a certain similarity, which is quite small, quite eight small. amino acids, yes, yes, then you have to do more yes. testing. Yes. It's not that it's declared an allergen because um, probably everyone in the world is allergic to something, something but the major allergens are very well known. The peanut proteins, the... That's, that's not an allergen. <laughs> that, that's really a toxin. So I'm again here confronting you. Okay, not so what, do I get a not go not for, vote from you? You were not, not exactly confronting. You were you were uh, borderline before. Are you still borderline? <laughs> yeah, still borderline. I'm batting for poverty. I'm batting for your uh, you know uh, so-called uh, greenhouse uh, you know uh, heat in this world. And you said GMO is required to see that poverty is come back. I didn't say that. No, I no, said we'll need biology. No, 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 no. no, no, no. You know, that's also a point. You know, GMO is all, again biology and where yeah, you, but the point you is, there is a need for it. Now I'll, I'll complete it. I'll right. complete it. But the point is that plant breeding is much, much slower than taking a gene. So at ICRSAT, they've identified genes in plants that survive at 45 degrees. Now, if you take that gene, no, I from agree with, a not crossing. No, I agree with that. Okay, so the science science has always claimed that it is a panacea for everything, and the no. science. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm That's telling nonsense. you, I'm, it's not. It's, it's not your. It's not your point of view. It's the point of view of me. Okay, uh, panacea, Pan and the people. Is not no, the, a panacea. no, no, no. The, the present situation, which is right now here, you're talking about GMO and all that is again a manifestation of the kind of research and people thought agriculture, we are improving agriculture. Now, you know, they brought some science into it. Is, and that, is there they, a question no, in there? No, 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 I'll come back to you. No, why, why this has arisen? Why this problem has arisen? Why people are not wanting science to go beyond a certain limit? Is because all that science itself has brought this kind of situation now. Global warming has come because of the kind of science which we, which we preached. People started growing thousands and thousands and millions of acres question? with one particular crop question? and America America has gone for that. Is there a question? You, no, it is brought from your side, from the science. People are wanting to see that it doesn't go beyond the limit and that's why there are a lot of uh, people who are afraid about GMO because scientists are the ones who brought this. Scientists are the ones who are giving uh, the kind of uh, solutions for that. So p why Vandana Siva or common people are dressing is because of that. They've seen nature, they love nature. They love that and say they people are going beyond that. Is there anybody that has a question? That, that is an uh, no, um, I mean, I, I can answer this, sir. And, uh, no, no, uh, no, she has answered that. And if you have a question, please ask it. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I don't. She's saying that there's no question there's in no what question. you asked. I'm, I'm answering question. question. You want to answer that non-question? <laughs> that's not fair. Can I, mean. can I, sir? Uh, I think that's one way of looking at it. <laughs> but there's another way of looking at it as well. You know, the life expectancy of people in this country was close to 40 years. Now you can expect to live up more than 70 years. And that's science. And you can Prince not so. deny the role of science in the health sector. No, one second. The food production system in our country was 50 million tons of food grains when we came out of the British rule or the colonial rule. But and, also, the, and the famines. Also the famines. Also the famines the, the of fam the Bengal, the yes, last one exactly. that we had. And those are gone. So today it is 250 million, over 250 million. In fact, we don't have hunger deaths anymore in this country. At least officially that's not there. 
Uh, in fact, we have a problem of storing some of the excess production that we have. Uh, you look at any field, uh, science has had a role to play. There has been instances where unanticipated effects have come. People tend to conflate some of those exceptions. You know, they call about the tryptophan story or the thalidomide child. I think you should keep those away when you debate about responsible introduction of science. And we are talking about responsible introduction of science to address poverty, to address some of these issues that we are facing today. And when you look at it that way, I think the picture is that science is a big component in the number of solutions that you need to actually provide. So I don't think any responsible scientist will say that science is a panacea. Uh, I think it is the other side which keeps on repeating that scientists say that science, it is not a silver bullet. It is one component, but an essential component yes, as uh, Professor Nina Fedorov tried to portray. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, to introduce him is uh, Professor K.K. Narayanan. Can I, who, can, I add, uh, can I add to that? that? I think one of the things that you're concerned about is some sort of artificial limits. And at every stage of the introduction of an innovation, people have considered that unacceptable, morally enough, so whatever it is. I cited to you the example of in vitro fertilization. Well, that was considered religiously unacceptable, morally unacceptable. Human morality evolves. And I would focus on the today, at, at a point where our population was low, then morality, particularly through religions, focused on increasing the population. Today, human beings have made a mess of the environment. So one of the highest moral principles today is to do things sustainably so that we <clears throat> pass a, a livable earth to children. So that has become a moral imperative. Sure. Uh, uh, Professor Narayanan, I was telling you about, he, he, uh, he founded the company called Metahelix, which is now owned, uh, uh, operated and managed by the Tata uh, Foundation. And uh, he was one of our reviewers for a number of our projects with the DBT and the DST. Thank you for those lovely comments. Uh, thanks for coming for this, really. I, I have a very brief comment and a question. Uh, the comment uh, in response to the borders or boundaries of science, I think I want all the youngsters here to understand that quote-unquote science, when it began with Francis Bacon, science is always about breaking boundaries, not putting boundaries. That's very important. Okay? Now, given that, who in this room will decide what is the border? And on what, what basis? We cannot. And that defeats the spirit of science if you try to put borders. Number one. The question is about what do we scientists do? I guess the answer lies in understanding human psyche. Uh, I think when, much, much more than we do today. Yeah. So, you know, not only, whatever you do, if there are people who don't want to be convinced, you cannot convince them. Correct. Isn't it? You, you, can, you could yes. always come up with an unbeatable yes. argument. But we know that building trust with another person, Absolutely. addressing his or her underlying yeah. concerns um, is effective in building trust. And then people... <coughs> who have rigid beliefs, will sometimes engage their uh, scientific, more scientific yes. reasoning. But that's not the way beliefs No, my limited work. point is that Luddites were there, Luddites are there now, and they will be there in future. And we just, the answer to the question is what can scientists do, is to just wait out. Yeah. But I think, no, I don't think it's waiting out. I think there's a role at every level. Um, I think that things would not be moving in our USDA today if we didn't have a continuous dialogue with the folks in the, in the department. So I, my feeling here is that there is not enough communication with politicians. And, the communica and it's not just any communication. The reason I showed that clip is that you know politicians are people too. So delivering rapid fire facts doesn't work. Okay? Making messages visually, however you make them, works much, much better. Are there any efforts to bring politicians, scientists, and the green biotechnologists together 
to ease the legislation? Say that again. Uh, should Are there one any efforts elsewhere yeah. to bring scientists, green biotechnologies, and the politicians together to ease the legislation? Ultimately, it is the legislation that is very important. I, I think that would be nice. This is really what happened. That's how the, the early um, flexibility in the U.S. regulatory process happened, because the recombinant DNA advisory committee had political people on it, including you know, legislators and scientists and anti-GMO people. So that process eventually um, created communication between the politicians, especially, and the scientists. Uh, but I think you have to do it at all levels, individually and in groups. Now, one of the things that our academy did was to bring documentary filmmakers together with scientists. Filmmakers know how to deliver a very human message. Scientists don't. Yes. So bringing them together and catalyzing better representation. So usually the videos that scientists make, it's just really boring. I, I agree with that. And uh, one of those guys, the Indian, who got the field medal in mathematics, uh, Manjul Bhargava, he wanted to make a... Uh, you know, make known to people about uh, Srinivas Ramanujan and he could make it through a film. The film is called The Man Who Knew Infinity. I, I suggest you watch this. I think we are running out of time. I am sure this topic is something which is wonderful and it can go on till the evening and for several days. Um, sorry, we cannot because uh, the Vice Chancellor is here and uh, we have to stop at this. But then there is tea after this and then we can always discuss with her and uh, we can debate that with our faculty anyway. Yeah. So I thank uh, Professor Nina Fadaro for the excellent inspiring meetings. But, and uh, before we uh, conclude the sessions, may I invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Rajendra Prasad, to give his remarks, please. Do you want me here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, Professor uh, Nina Ma'am and my colleagues and dear students. First, I would like to congratulate Professor uh, Nina Ma'am for the excellent uh, lecture given on the occasion of uh, the Janaki Amal Chair. See, this is uh, one thing uh, which there is, uh, if I recall, the history, how we have progressed. I think our uh, IAC man has already mentioned about from 50 million tons of food production to today, this year 2017 and 18, we have crossed 284 million tons. Why it happened so? Because the series of technology, the intervention of uh, different uh, people, including the farmers, the scientists and the, uh, the policy makers and different organizations. So we have achieved the past green revolutions and again the history, the beginning, then we started the introduction of new varieties, pesticides, then mechanizations, then comes the BT cotton. So you know how much uh, difficulty we have faced in the sense the country have faced to introduce the BT cotton, and now today, the most of the people are happy. It's not only in terms of the money which they are getting, in terms of the <coughs> protecting the environment also because of the loss of pesticides and other things we were using which has come down. So these are all the some of the events which have taken. Again, recently, there are so many mix that is genomics, proteomics. So many things, the things are coming now. But as uh, Professor mentioned in her slide, the last few slides, what is the populations which is going on? And the arable land is coming down. And the resources, it's coming down. Then the challenge before us to address these challenges, what are the things? Because this food productions has to continue to feed this ever-growing population. In that case, 
what are the different uh, interventions we being the scientists to address. So in fact, uh, about one year back, the DG, then DG Dr. Ayapan has called one meeting by involving all the technocrats, scientists, and also in that meeting, even Dr. Swaminathan was there. So we have achieved the first green revolutions. For the next revolutions, green revolutions, what are our targets? In the beginning, we have concentrated more on the only the few crops, especially on the paddy and the wheat. Today, we have to address so many things and what are the set targets for the evergreen revolutions or the second green revolutions. This was the debate which we had for almost two days. During those days, those uh, days, there are many points have emerged. The first one is the crops which we have to address is we have to look at the other crops like pulses and the oil seeds for which we are spending lot of money for the import. So this is one of the aspects. The second one is, as I has mentioned, we have overproduction. We don't have any. No, we have having the problem of storage of the food grains. The second and foremost important thing, which was the lecture was given by Dr. Manjunath, probably you were uh, heard of uh, the entomologist, biocontrol uh, agent man. He has a given a lecture. He is mentioned, see today the loss, the post-harvest loss is almost to the tune of 20 to 25 percent. If you address this issue today, because the amount of the resources which we are investing on these 25% of the productions, what we are doing, it is a great save. So here, there are two achievements we are going to make. One is, we are going to save the produce which you have made. The second one is, the resources which we are going to utilize on those things. This is the second point which we have deliberated on that day. And the third point is, the emerging was the hybrid technology. This is one area where we should look into that so that we can keep on producing the, you know, increasing the productivity. The third important thing is the GM technology. This is also one of the area where they have deliberated, yes, to address these things, we have to go for the GM technology. Of course, there are a lot of controversies and again, again, there was a discussion. So today, the madam has clearly mentioned what the advance of the stony technology, this is the need of the hour and also the other part, the confusions which we could see. The first question my friend, uh, Dr. Uh, the PhD students, Mr. Ganesh has really asked, 88% of the scientific community were convinced, why not for the other 12% of the community, scientific community. Later I'll come to the other part. Because why, why they are not convinced? Because they're all intellectuals. Unless we convince these 12%, can we able to convince the rest of the, you know, 63% of the people? So this is one thing which I would like to, you know, this body has to address. Then again, 37%, as Madam also mentioned, and when there was a question they were asking, what is GMO? Many people are not able to even uh, spell out what exactly it is GMO. It is not something, something they were saying. It is fine. When in the country like USA and all those things, when they are using many of the things, GMO, when they are not able to understand what exactly, the situations like us, yes, we need to address this issue. That means we have to. In the university, I think uh, maybe about uh, four or five months back, there was a meeting with uh, the CCAM and all our uh, biotechnologists, and they have involved the farmers and the group of NGOs to deliberate on this issue, what exactly. In fact, today, today I expected some farmers or some NGO should have been here because this is the discussions what we are made in discussing about the issues for and again. Though we could have, we could have taken their inputs also. We try to convince 
what I want to ask here is, being the agriculture university here, what is our role to convince the farmers? Can we bring, Dr. Ravi Kumar has mentioned one important point, that is creating a platform. Can we bring all these people together, that is policy makers, then the scientists, then the farmers, then the students, because it needs, if you look at the presentations what she has made, that means we are failing or maybe we are not able to convince the people even the technology is good enough. Because there is a lot of, you know, the statements. And uh, the other two guys, that is Mrs. Vandana Rao and also Mr. Jeffrey Smith, we should try to take their, you know, what exactly they need, why they are opposing. I don't know, because first time I'm, you know, listening, I, I read many, you know, stories, this one. Can we not be able to convince such kind of people by giving the scientific reasons? This is my question. Again, during one of the meetings, the people were saying, you know, this is uh, far with the BT. Yes, we would like to have it provided there should be a biosafety measures. In fact, in case of sugarcane varieties, I think Indonesia has developed the variety, that is GMO varieties, that is drought resistant variety. In fact, the team from the Maharashtra have been deputed to that place to look into that because Maharashtra is the state where the sugarcane area is more and uh, not last year, the previous year there is a huge drought. So to address those problems, can we think of the varieties developed under this mechanism and introduced? This was the one which, which I read in the paper. So like that, when people are, you know, we have the lot of uh, problems and the issues. You see, for instance, the papaya virus, still there is no solutions for the ring spot virus of the papaya. As a result, many farmers are facing the problems. Can we address by this technology? Then another thing is, since I was associated with the sunflower for uh, this one, the area under sunflower is coming down. The reason behind this, the one of the disease is the necrosis. This is one of the reasons. Because our scientists are working, but still we are not able to give the clear cut, you know, solutions for this. As a result, many people are not opting for this one. This is one of the reasons. There are so many reasons why the area is coming down. But still, this is the one of the reasons. Because we started digging, what are the reasons why this particular crop is coming down, area is coming down. Because still we are importing a lot of oils and giving a lot of, you know, spending a lot of our, you know, money. So these are the issues which, when we are talking about the biosafety and other things, you tell me, many people are eating non-vegetarian chicken. Okay, now what they are saying, they are injecting some hormone to the, chicken so that the growth of the chicken is more and other things. So, is it not affecting our, uh, this one in the long run? What is the measures which we have taken? This is one example which I am taking. When coming to the other one, you see the pesticides and we are drinking the soft drinks and other things, you know, Coca-Cola, there also we could see lot of herbicides and other things. So what is the measures we are taking? So again, we are eating the vegetables. The vegetable producer himself, they say, Sir, Idina, so most of you know the Canada, Idina salpa upnir ne lakya the nella insecticides so fungicides so takadbut tindra vallad sir and tell thing. No, no. These are all the issues already going on in our routine things other than the VT cartons or VT products. My point is, see, in every system, there is some kind of you know, maybe adulterations, what you call, and other things. But we must ensure 
there should be a strict supervision and the safety against those measures by which we can also take the in the similar fashions the bt and we can we can so this is what uh, i wanted to say then another thing is just i would like to ask the madam this is 37% the farmers somebody asked and uh, are the common people they are you know accepting one what about the other percentage what are the mechanism which we would like to adopt to convince them if it is really worth it or really working so these are all the some of my suggestions i am not talking about the you know technology and other things the technology about about the technology ma'am and many people have deliberated interacted so my suggestions to this group again dr satyanarayan has also mentioned about uh, we have to address the poor people and also the end users you are right but what is me what is he means means not at the cost of certain things maybe the nature maybe the things that should be our uh, motto that means whatever the technology not only the bt technology or the gmo technology or any technology that should not affect our you know maybe the nature or our uh, other activities today the people are again going back to the organic so many things are you know coming so like that this is also one of the technology with this few remarks from my side uh, i wish there should be some common platform to discuss and uh, make this be more implementable instead of we people are you know just fighting and bringing in the media and all those things that never works it will keep on extending like this because every problem will have a solutions but for those solution how we should address that is more important that matters a lot so let us have a kind of series of activities as i mentioned create a platform create a awareness program which is happening it may be having in a large scale so like that uh, we should really involve the end users and make them to convince this is what i wanted to give the message with this uh, i would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to say a few words thank you one and all thank you very much sir and i think uh, to cap up what he said there are this 12% of people who it's not that we can convince them because they're not convincible like can forget about them so uh, may i invite uh, uh, rl ravi kumar to complete this program by proposing the thanks to everyone Uh, respected uh, dignitaries and uh, fellow participants i on behalf of uh, university of agriculture sciences bangalore would like to uh, thank dr uh, professor nina fedrov for her excellent uh, talk on this i feel such talks uh, should be in the local languages also and some extension agency should be engaged in trying to convince the people uh, rural people or the public uh, in india hope we will take it forward from here onwards i also request our honorable vice chancellor to pres- vice chancellor to present a small memento to her i take this uh, opportunity to thank our uh, vice chancellor for making time to attend this uh, uh, talk and uh, i also thank indian academy of sciences for uh, facilitating this talk and i also thank our uh, pg dean and his staff for taking uh, efforts to make this uh, talk uh, possible finally i'll thank all the participants thank you very much uh, tea has been arranged outside you can have uh, also thank the media